Hi there, I'm Dr Catherine McGlynn from the University of Huddersfield where I'm a senior lecturer in politics. In this first talk we're going to look at the outbreak of conflict that's popularly known as the Troubles, uh, an event lasting in Northern Ireland from 1968 to 1998. Now before we get into that there's a few labels that I have to explain, words that keep coming up if you study the history and politics of Northern Ireland and you'll want to know what these labels are. Northern Ireland comes into being in 1921 as a result of the Government of Ireland Act which partitions the island of Ireland and six counties in the north remain as part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Now this split and the War of Independence leading up to it reflect two political identities and preferences about Ireland's government and future. You have Unionists who believe that the union between Great Britain and Ireland and later Northern Ireland was legitimate reflecting a British identity and the right of the British government to be on the territory. Because of religious identity developing in tandem with national identity uh, across the British Isles, that was associated with Protestantism. So you'll often hear Unionists referred to as Protestants interchangeably. You'll also hear the word loyalism. Now loyalism has uh, different meanings in it depending on the context, but for our purposes, we all understand loyalism to uh, be associated with the ideology that defending the union between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, it's perfectly acceptable to do that using violence, including violence against the British state. On the other side, you have nationalism, the Irish nationalist movement, stating that the island of Ireland is one nation, one people, and therefore should have its own state. And that means that British territory uh, should not apply to the island of Ireland, and British have no jurisdiction there. Again, because of that interlinking between religion and identity, you will often hear nationalists uh, referred to as Catholics. Now, even in this secular age, if you look at data from a helpful resource like the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, you will see that people who state their religion as Catholic and Protestant, they are still allied to those positions of nationalist and unionist. And again, associated with nationalism, you will hear the term republicanism. The ideology that not only is Ireland entitled to have self-determination, it is perfectly legitimate to use violence against the British state to create an all-Ireland republic. So those are the labels, those are the terms, sometimes you'll hear the words two communities or two traditions as well, but those are the people that we are speaking about. So when Northern Ireland came into being, it got its own parliament in Stormont and had a lot of responsibility uh, on the day-to-day -day running of Northern Ireland's affairs. The Unionist majority had more votes and therefore more seats in Stormont. And the practice of gerrymandering, uh, particularly in the west of Ireland, cities such as London, Stroke London, Derry, uh, they meant that the drawing of boundaries minimised the impact of nationalist votes. Nationalists were less likely to be voters at local government le uh, level when one had to be a homeowner or ratepayer because of discrimination in housing. And nationalists were also angry about discrimination in employment and discrimination because of the security setup of Northern Ireland. Under something called the Special Powers Act, Northern Ireland effectively was in a state of emergency and an overwhelmingly unionist police force was in charge of operating uh, security practices. In the 1960s, nationalists inspired by Martin Luther King's civil rights movement formed civil rights protests of their own. And in 1967, the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association came into being. They wanted to copy Martin Luther King's non-violent program of action to draw attention to discrimination and receive equality within the state. However, for unionists, this was absolutely panic inducing. Nationalists had never recognised the legitimacy of Northern Ireland. There had been sporadic attempts to engage in paramilitary violence and unionists were angry about the fact that nationalists had been abstentionists. They'd never participated in Northern Ireland's political life. So to see people marching, ostensibly demanding equality within the state, to many unionists this was a, a fifth column or a way of driving uh, the union towards its end. So the marchers began to meet violence, violence by uh, unionist uh, passers-by and those uh, watching the marches, sometimes with a tacit turning of a blind eye by the security forces, sometimes with off-duty security force members involved. And this was taking place in the full glare of the world's media. So the British government, which had tried to kind of ignore Northern Ireland by uh, convention, for example, questions could never be asked about it in Parliament at Westminster, the government had to act. 
And when violence began to spill out into rioting, and then particularly in Belfast, into the displacing of people, particularly nationalists from their homes, the British government decided that the way to act was to send the army in. So the army was sent in to protect the nationalist community. However, that spontaneous violence on both sides shortly coalesced into the formation of paramilitary organisations, groups who were prepared to pursue their political preference through violence. Republican paramilitaries on the nationalist side were the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, or the Irish National Liberation Army, INLA. On the loyalist side, you have paramilitaries from the UVF, or Ulster Volunteer Force, and the larger UDA, or Ulster Defence Association. The Army's protection of the nationalist community, as far as nationalists was concerned, turned swiftly towards oppression of it. Uh, matters such as curfews uh, began to antagonise them. There was still at this point a parliament at Stormont. They were pushing the government at Westminster for more security solutions, while the government at Westminster were pushing them to reform and meet the civil rights movement's demands. However, the British government listened to the parliament at Stormont and its demand for internment. This means locking people up without trial, in this case because they were suspected of being part of paramilitary organisations. Internment was carried out on the basis of very poor intelligence and it was focused overwhelmingly on the nationalist community, stoking resentment and frustration even more and fueling recruitment to the paramilitaries. However, the final straw for the Parliament at Stormont wasn't actually something that they had control over because the British army government was in charge of the army. In 1972, a civil rights march in Derry was fired upon by British paratroopers and 14 unarmed civilians were killed. In the resulting outcry over this event, referred to as Bloody Sunday, the government decided it could no longer try to balance security solutions while having Stormont push uh, for uh, political solutions. It took the decision to prorogue Stormont, essentially to press the pause button, but in reality abolishing it. It never came back in that form. Direct rule is then the government's responsibility, but immediately they wanted to return devolution to Northern Ireland just in a new form, power sharing, where both unionist and nationalist political representatives would have genuine dialogue with each other and make decisions together. As a result of the Sunningdale Agreement in 1973, the first attempt at this new form of devolution was brought to Northern Ireland and an executive was elected of unionists and nationalists. However, it was brought down in a mere matter of months. A combined general strike undertaken by loyalist paramilitaries and trade unionists caused the Sunningdale institutions to collapse. The early years of the troubles against which the Sunningdale experiment were failing were some of the most violent of the entire period. And at this point, it looked as if nobody would be able to engage in negotiation or compromise or find a way through. But in 20 years time, most of the same players would be sitting at a negotiating table, ready to think about peace and the way forward.